Hey, to a new video. No more long hair. Well, not long for me anyway. I've been getting a lot of comments on one of my videos, the we make a song in 15 minutes or less. And there's a lot of positive comments that are really cool. And there's a lot of negative comments as you would probably imagine because it's kind of riding the line between informative and clickbaity and a fun experiment. There's definitely the comments that are talking about, oh, that's so generic. Of course it was. We made an exercise in making a song in 15 minutes. But it's important to always stretch yourself. You gotta try new things. You gotta force yourself into habits to make it count when stuff's actually on the line here. So the fact that we could do that helped us practice other skills, not necessarily the song itself. But to do that, one of the big things that everybody's talking about was the theory that we used. This is not gonna be a video about me describing music theory to you, but those numbers that we're talking about, going from a six to a four to a two. <laughs> the and abstract is six so after that, or are we gonna? I don't wanna do a six after, because then we have just landed in, in so many different pop songs. 11 minutes. What about a, 11 what minutes to what write four? it? Yeah. Or jumping from different keys, making twos different, working it that way. A lot of people got a little upset that we were doing music theory, we didn't have instruments in our hands. So, or even some people saying, I've been a pro musician for years and I've literally never heard anybody say a number. Okay, well that could be regional. Everybody could have their own way that they speak to music. We're pretty close to Nashville. So what we were doing was the Nashville number system. That doesn't mean it's the end all be all of how to communicate music, but what it is for us and how we use it, it's a tool to describe music and harmony in a way that's not attached to key. It's not attached to an instrument. It's not attached to anything. Man, I was gonna use this guitar as an illustration, but. Now I wanted to talk about this mainly because I saw a video that Mike Palmisano put out and if you don't watch his videos, they're fantastic. Way better guitar player than I could ever hope to be. Using those numbers as a way to talk through music without being attached to key. It's a way to talk harmony. It's just a language. Instead of somebody coming up with a riff and then we're just sitting here, you know, maybe the, maybe the guitar is tuned different, which this one is, it is not in standard tuning. To where if somebody is familiar enough with an instrument to look over, oh, he's playing, he's playing a G. No, I'm not, because I'm, I'm tuned differently. Because I like different voicings on this guitar in particular. All that aside, the numbers are a way to talk without with kind of being like agnostic about what you're playing, right? Now you start talking voicings of chords. Speaking in numbers allows you to think in patterns, not necessarily G is always G, C is always C, D is always D. We can do that, but in the studio, it's about efficiency. And let me be some, let me let me be real clear about this. I'm not as good a musician as the other guys in that video. I'm just not, and I know that about myself. And I've really struggled to get into the music theory side of this. So what little I do know, I have really worked to get there, to be able to hang with those guys and talk like they talk. But when we do, we move so much faster. And when other people's money is on the line, when an artist is in here and we're trying to take their ideas and then we start talking numbers and, and then that allows us to think about transitions because a whole world of musical opportunity opens up to you. It's not necessarily being in your head about music theory, it's a tool. And I think it's silly if we don't allow ourselves to use the tools that we have. Now, I'm not good enough to sit down and write a song straight cerebral in my head. Some of those guys are. And they can, they're, it's not that they're overeducated thinking about music from this elitist standpoint. They love that craft. We should be able to learn about things that we love and have a passion about. And that should be okay. Why is it that we have this mentality that to study music automatically makes you invalid? That this thing that you want to get really, really good at, but if you go beyond the certain point, you're, you're no longer good at it. You're a sellout. If myself as a producer, engineer, only used my ear all the time with every band that came in, I would have a whole lot of miscommunications. Mainly because sometimes those bands want to rework some things. And if we're just going by what they're playing, 
sometimes we're gonna end up with something pretty nasty. Is how often do you guys, and, and tell me this. Some of you guys who don't necessarily dig this method, you say, okay, get, get four guys in a room, jam it out, I could have a song. That's awesome. And if you have a, a group of musicians who knows exactly what's happening, then that is awesome. And you guys are very, very talented. We aren't that talented, so we need to roadmap what's happening. And we do that through talking rhythms, through talking numbers, through talking bars, beats in bars. Now, of course, I, I, don't, I don't think either one of these writing styles is better than the other. They're different. They serve different purposes. I think you could get the exact same end result through either method, but one of them is gonna be faster. And of course that depends on your context. We're in the studio. Time is money, and the longer I keep people here, the longer I'm paying players, the longer I'm trying to figure out what the artist is actually doing with their hands and communicate that to the players, the more money that costs the person. So, so picture this, what would you rather have? You going into a professional studio, would you rather have the producer learning everything by rote and then teaching it to the players by rote, which means by your ear, nobody write anything down and jam it out, or, do you wanna write everything down? Really take a look at it. Make sure these harmonies and these voicings are gonna be working together. And there are certain things that markets respond to. Even when you're talking about your own music and you're heavily into someone, you're basically doing music theory in your head already. You just don't put words to it. There were a lot of people in the comments talking about these huge bands who they listened to in the 70s, 80s, 90s, who, who don't use music theory. They just go by their ear and what feels right. 90% of the time, you are absolutely wrong. Go I would challenge you to sit down and actually look at how some of these greats create music. I'm not saying every single one of them is a theory nerd, but I think they know a whole lot more about the craft than you give them credit for. And some of these older songs are so harmonically rich to the point where there's thought put into it. I'm not saying no one could get there by ear, but it's the art of learning a craft. The way I see it, there's very little difference between people talking music theory in a studio scenario and people talking about why they like vinyl. You'll go down that rabbit hole with vinyl. <laughs> pick the best amp, pick the best speaker, and you need this, this certain needle so that you can hear everything the way it was meant to be heard. And sometimes it's with records that are created digitally. They were putting them on vinyl is kind of silly. Something created on a computer then getting pressed to vinyl. That's, that's weird. Well, that's, that's another rant. That's another rant, getting off topic. But how is it any different than somebody nerding out about vinyl and the consumption of music that way and somebody nerding out about theory? and using it as a tool to get better at their craft that they're passionate about. Make no mistake, I think there's people who are way too into the rules. When I was in college and going in theory, I seriously struggled and I had a few of my friends like tutoring me after every single class because I could not get it. I was in a rock band for a long, long time. I used my ears. I did not think this really mattered until a few years after college and I started doing this in the studio and I realized I should have paid a lot more attention. There's there's definitely stuff here. There's a lot of validity to feeling the music and feeling the emotion and letting that drive intention with the song. But there's this whole other level of knowing theory only for the purpose of being able to understand other musical works and pick out the little things that you like. You're like, oh, I really love adding the two in this chord or uh, the sound of a nine or that minor two in that song is just so cool. I love that rub. Being able to hear that and know it without having to sit at your guitar and figure out what that chord is and then apply it to a different key, you start to see how this simplifies things. And I'm no master at it. I'm constantly learning and I'm constantly trying to get better because that just means I get faster. And the thing about music theory, the more I learn it, it's not making me less of a creative individual. If anything, it's doing the opposite. I find myself being able to do the things that I hear in my head because I can articulate them through some other method and translate that to any instrument I want in any key that I want. Overall, this argument that you're wasting time if you're trying to describe music in any way, maybe. Maybe that's not how you create music. 
Or maybe that's not how you choose to appreciate music and that's totally valid. But it's a lot like the Mac versus Windows argument. It's just stupid. Whatever tools we can use to make better music, that's all that matters. The caveat there is that music is subjective. So regardless if you guys liked that song that we made in that 15 minute video, doesn't really matter, but it's not the theory that you didn't like. <laughs> it was the song that you didn't like, and that's okay. I'm not really into that either, <laughs> but it was an exercise. But it's important to do exercises that stretch your musical boundaries. We can't all make classic rock all the time. We can't all just sit out and jam all the time because everybody's song is gonna go one, four, five. Because every guitar player is sitting down, G, C, D, every time. <laughs> playing with numbers and playing with music theory, playing with different tunings, playing with different voicings, knowing how to communicate that to other people, I guarantee you'll get more creative ideas. You're not gonna all of a sudden turn into a scholarly person who's above all music ever. It won't happen. I challenge you, if you're one of those people that you play by feel, play by ear only, everything else is a waste of time, I was in your camp not so long ago. I challenge you to step out of your comfort zone. Try, try to go and chart your favorite song. You don't have to use numbers. You don't have to use theory. Play it on your guitar, write it down. Do that to a few songs, then try to change that key. Now in the time it took you to do that, imagine if you could just be listening, hearing patterns. You don't have to have a guitar in your hand. You know what a one, four, five sounds like. So you could chart the whole song in your head without needing an instrument. Then you could communicate that to everybody. I mean, honestly, if you're in a band, why wouldn't that be your goal? To be able to communicate things fast. To be able to have that musical dialogue so that you spend less time teaching parts and more time jamming. Because I'll tell you what, you could teach somebody what you're playing on the guitar so that you can jam it out. Or you can say, guys, we're gonna go on a six, four, one, four times to the five and then wrap it around. You could teach everybody your part on the guitar for a few minutes so you could jam it out and then see what happens. That's totally valid. Or you could say, here's the shape we're gonna start with. Lay out some numbers and you're still gonna jam. <laughs> it's no different. It's just faster. Ultimately, this doesn't have much to do with numbers. This doesn't have much to do with music theory. It's about respect and a lot of different things. That's it's like getting upset with the person in front of you orders at Subway. So somebody orders a club with mayonnaise on it and you're, you're offended because you don't like mayonnaise. Well, shut up. It's not your mayonnaise. <laughs> you don't have to eat it. I don't really have a big point for this one to end on other than the thought. And this is just a thought. Some people make music and there's a thousand different ways to make music. Each one is valid. It's more about how your brain works. I know I get stuck in habits and shapes on the guitar and number, numbers help me break out of that. Forcing myself to learn that has forced me into thinking about this instrument differently. And I'm not a strong enough player to get to that point on my own. Some people, you're a very, very strong player and you don't need that and that's fine. And you play by yourself and you write songs by yourself, but then you're doing it the most efficient way for you already. But thinking that your way applies to everyone, whether we're in the studio, or we're playing with bands, it's, that's not a healthy way to look at music in any way. <laughs> Ultimately, get out there, make music, and don't worry about what other people are doing. If you guys agree with me, tell me in the comments down below. Hit the like button. Share it with somebody you think needs to hear this. If you disagree with me and you have a point that you thought I haven't considered, let me know in the comments. Anyway guys, that's it for this one. I'm Resident Loser Jeremy. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.